and mourn for those lost this week. Uh, it also uh, is a time for us to reflect uh, on uh, our lives, our, our families, our careers, and I'm so greatly honored to be a, a member of the House of Representatives, and there are so many things about the job that uh, I love. And one of those things that uh, we were concerned that coronavirus was going to uh, put an end to, but nonetheless, we were able to move forward on uh, is one of the great joys of the office, and that's the annual congressional art competition. Now, normally we would be having an event around this time at the Oceanside Museum of Art. We would be bringing together all of our local high school students from all across the district uh, and looking at their amazing pieces of art. Uh, but this year we're doing it a little bit different. Uh, we got a ton of submissions online and we had uh, our great judges. Uh, and uh, I'm really pleased to uh, welcome uh, Maria Mingalone from the Oceanside Museum of Art. Great to see you, Maria. Uh, very grateful that you're here. I wanna thank all the teachers uh, in the district. Uh, who encourage these young artists from across our high schools to submit their creations for the competition. We couldn't have done this without you. We're truly grateful. And we had a total, Maria, I understand, of 32 submissions from Oceanside, okay. Vista, Carlsbad, Pacific Ridge, San Diego Academy High Schools. And you can view the full gallery on my Facebook page. Now, to judge the art, we once again turn to uh, Maria from the museum. Uh, and she is here to tell us about some of these entrants. After we're done with the art competition, we will get back uh, to the topic of the day, a much more somber topic, COVID-19. But let us enjoy for just a moment the Congressional Art Competition. Maria, take it away. Thank you so much. We're so honored. I'm so honored to be here and um, really delighted that you've made time to celebrate some of the bright spots um, in our lives and in our district. So thank you so much for having me here and for making time for art. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Um, so one of the um, one of the things I wanted to share was that we had three judges, including myself, and then Zach Cordner, who is from Oceanside. And I wanted to share for those high school students who may be listening, he picked up his first camera at the age of 14. And um, from that point forward, he's been photograph photographing iconic um, people from our culture, including Tony Hawk and Elvis Costello. And he was the official photographer for the Coachella um, and is the current founder, one of the co-founders of the o Osider magazine. So we were happy to have Zach. And then the other judge was Erica Williams. And Erica has a graphic design um, degree from University of Illinois and uh, and worked in the advertising industry for a number of years. And so we were happy to have that mix. And then I was trained as a painter and a printmaker. So we had a good group of judges to judge the entrance. That was terrific. And what we were looking for while we were looking at the art was the mastery of the medium and the creative expression and also the quality of the presentation. So that was kind of the metrics that we used. And um, we were really impressed by the incredible high quality of the entrance artwork. Substantially, uh, su such of such substance, and we were really impressed. So it was hard to come up with our choices, I have to say. Well, I know. I uh, we have... Oh, go ahead, Maria. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, we asked uh, the judges to pick the top three, and they came back to us with four. So uh, it was very <laughs> tough to, to narrow everything down. Uh, but I want to start with our honorable mention, uh, which goes to a piece called Maya and Minnie's Day in the Snow by Ethan Simpson of Vista High School. Maria, can you let us know what the judges uh, loved about this piece? Yes, of course. If you look at the photograph, it captures a perfect moment. And it achieves this connection through the dog's eyes that is so captivating and it really draws you into, into the photograph. And technically speaking, it was really incredibly, um, the way they captured the snow and, and how it's in such focus. And at the same time, if you look really closely at the photograph, it never obscures the eyes of the subject. So we were really impressed by this piece, which is why we gave it honorable mention. Fantastic. 
And now we have the third place prize of $100, and that goes to Fragile Wings by Rhea Chocolingham. And I hope I got that right, Rhea. I practiced before this. Uh, and, she, and Rhea <laughs> is of the San Diego Academy in Encinitas. Maria, you want to talk about that piece? Sure. We were really impressed by the tremendous emotion um, and the emotional expression in this piece. And it's a great example of when somebody is using art as a form of expression and creating a conceptual, uh, taking a conceptual reality and emotion and making it material for all of us to understand and experience. Um, it's very well executed. There's a mastery of the material and we love the use of color. And it really set a mood um, for the piece. And it was beautifully, fully conceived and fully executed. So we we, uh, we gave that our third prize uh, placement. Very cool. All right. Second place in $300. And for those just tuning in, we will be talking about coronavirus in just a minute. We are talking <laughs> about art for, for a few minutes here with Maria from the Oceanside Museum of Art. This is our annual congressional art competition. Second place prize of $300 goes to self-reflection by Zaffer Maker Aga of the Pacific Ridge School in Carlsbad. Do you wanna talk about that piece, Maria? Yes, please, I do. Um, so there is so much creative mood that was created in this photograph um, with the way that the artist chose to create the shadow and the way that it outlines the face and also the way then the background has this blurry texture. So there's that soft focus that we have in the background. And um, this shows a real understanding and a mastery of the technique of photography and um, and shows that they're using the shallow depth of field and uh, creating this intense focus that's on the face. And um, it's a striking composition. So the way the placement of the figure in the piece and has this really great, unique perspective. So we really, uh, really love that. Beautiful piece, thank you so much. And the first place prize of $500, now normally this would include two round trip tickets to Washington DC for a national ceremony celebrating the artists. And of course we're gonna do that as soon as we're able to do those sorts of things again. But first place goes to Sunset at the San Diego County Fair by Juan Garcia of Oceanside High School. Uh, this piece is going to hang in the Capitol for one year. Maria, you want to talk about this piece? Yes, and um, Juan's a piece of the San Diego County Fair was something that we felt really captured the spirit of our region. Um, it's just so beautifully executed, and there's so much detail in the photograph that it just keeps you looking, and, um, and you want to explore all of the detail um, of the scene. And it's a scene that could easily become sentimental, but the artist did not go in that direction. There's a lot of rich color in the photograph, and this, there's a kind of electricity in the piece. And um, I say that both metaphorically and, and also literally, because there's a lot of neon lights and the kinds of lights that you would experience at a county fair. And then technically being able to execute that, to have that lighting and then that beautiful, gorgeous sunset. And we just thought what an amazing piece to have in Washington to represent Southern California. Well, that is an incredible piece and particularly in a year, Maria, where we're not going to have the San Diego County Fair uh, for the first time ever uh, or for many, many decades to, to be able to, to hang that piece in the Capitol. Uh, very grateful and wonderful, wonderful job by Juan Garcia of Oceanside High School uh, we also have a new category this year, and this is a fan favorite category, which received the most likes on our Facebook page. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that our fan favorite was Midday Ocotillo Wells by Tara McKinley of Vista High School. And this earned more than 260 likes on our Facebook page. And if the artist is willing, this piece is going to be displayed in our Oceanside District office for the next year. Very, very cool. Uh, I'd also like to thank our friends at Arts Orange County, the nonprofit Arts uh, Council that's led by Rick Stein uh, for providing the cash prizes to the top three artists. Uh, this was made possible by a grant uh, from AT&T, and I thank AT&T's regional representative, Richard Porras. Thanks again to Maria uh, and her fellow judges, Erica Williams and Zach Cordner, for their work on the 2020 Congressional Art Competition. 
Uh, and Maria, do you want to say anything about the Oceanside Art Museum, how people can check it out? Sure. Um, you can go to our website. We have, um, or you can hashtag virtual OMA. That's virtual OMA. And that's on Facebook, Twitter, and um, Instagram. Go to our website and do hashtag museum at home, and you'll be able to check out all of the amazing virtual online programming that we've been uh, doing since the stay at home order. We've, um, we've decided to take on the challenge and be really creative and innovative as artists are. So we're happy to, um, to be here and thank you for sharing uh, the contest. Well, I thank you, Maria. And as the son of an artist, uh, I can tell you that she's always inspired me with her art and her creativity. And I'm equally uh, thrilled by all the student art that we get uh, each year for the Congressional Art Competition. And well, I'm sad that we're not all together, uh, with you at the Oceanside Museum, I'm really, really pleased we were able to use this virtual town hall uh, to announce the winners of the 2020 Congressional Art Competition. Thanks again, Maria. It's great to see you. Great. Thank you. Nice to see you, too. Well, thank you, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank, thank you uh, for that. And, um, you know, I'd like now to, of course, turn to a far more somber topic, uh, which is the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and we have a, another fantastic local medical expert joining us today, Dr. Kenneth Roth, internal medicine specialist at Sharp Healthcare. Uh, he's here to answer our questions and to provide updates uh, on COVID-19. Dr. Roth is one of the original founders of Sharp Community and has served on the board of directors since the inception of Sharp in 1989. And he's held a number of council seats, including the executive committee, He's been on Sharp Community's Board of Directors uh, straight through and was elected president of the board in 2011. Dr. Roth, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, I do so much appreciate your inviting me here to be here with you today. And I just think uh, as a frontline physician and uh, you as a legislate, uh, legislator, how much we can really do together uh, to tackle this COVID epidemic. But I'm very, very grateful to be here today. Thank you. Absolutely. And for those wondering at home, we did not coordinate uh, wardrobes prior to this uh, town hall. Uh, our wives uh, respectively thought these would be nice uh, outfits for us, but it all <laughs> it worked out and we're matching today. Um, I just wanted to briefly reset for, for our viewers and listeners where we are with regard to COVID-19. Uh, the U.S., as I'm sure you know, has the most confirmed cases in the world with uh, approaching 1.4 million now 83,648 deaths. California has confirmed 72,506 cases, uh, approaching 3,000 deaths. San Diego County, 5,161 cases and 190 deaths. Orange County, 3,749 cases and 80 deaths. And again, these are more than just statistics. These are husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, friends and colleagues. And my thoughts are with everyone who's sick, who's recovering, uh, or who's coping with the loss of loved ones. Uh, and at the same time that we face this public health crisis, we also face a very daunting economic crisis. Uh, I understand everyone's frustration uh, with uh, the stay at home orders and closed businesses, closed public spaces. Uh, we all wanna get back to normal as quickly and as safely as we can. Uh, and that means listening to the experts, means following public health recommendations, and it means expanding testing capacity. Uh, the sooner we're gonna do these things, the sooner we're gonna be able to get back uh, to normal, or at least to some semblance of normal and to reopening safely. Uh, as I mentioned in our past virtual town halls, Congress has passed four major bills to deal with coronavirus. We're actually going to uh, Washington, I'll be flying to Washington tomorrow to pass the fifth uh, piece of legislation, which I hope uh, will lead to bipartisan compromise very soon. Uh, the first was back on March 6th, really not that long ago when you think about it. Uh, but on March 6th, we passed an $8.3 billion supplemental appropriation for the vaccine, uh, for equipment stockpiles, and for state and local health budgets. Then in the middle of March, we passed the family's first bill. That's about $200 billion primarily for paid sick and family leave to create tax credits for affected employers to expand food and nutrition uh, and more. Then at the end of March, we passed the third bill, which you're probably familiar with, $2.2 trillion. It's called the CARES Act. Uh, and uh, then we passed a fourth bill um, fairly recently, about three weeks ago, 
uh, that had uh, an additional huge chunk of money for small businesses. It had money for hospitals, for testing. Uh, so uh, all in, uh, we are close to about $3 trillion for COVID-19 related relief. You may have heard about the new bill. It's called the HEROES Act. And it is an additional $3 trillion to help Americans during this crisis and to deal with both the economic challenges and the public health challenges that we face. As I've said time and again, the only way we're going to have a healthy economy is if we have healthy people. So the way to deal with the economic crisis in the long term is to deal with the public health crisis and to make sure we do all we can uh, to uh, alleviate the impact of the virus. Uh, this morning, you may have heard the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank, Jerome Powell, he restated the need for Congress to immediately pass further economic aid. He said, quote, additional fiscal support could be costly but worth it if it helps avoid long-term economic damage and leaves us with a stronger recovery. This trade-off is one for elected representatives who wield powers of taxation and spending. Well, as the Fed chairman said, uh, we need to think boldly and aggressively uh, and we need to avoid the long-term economic damage and deal with the facts on the ground. And I think our legislation, the HEROES Act, delivers the strong and urgent response that this crisis requires. Uh, a science-based approach to reopening the economy with testing, tracing, and treatment to honor our heroes with robust funding for local government and hazard pay. And ultimately, we need to put more money in the pockets of workers and families. And the HEROES Act does all of this. Uh, it's a massive crisis. It's going to require historic action and great urgency. So I strongly believe that in the days and weeks ahead, Republicans and Democrats will come together. I think the HEROES Act that we're passing tomorrow in the House is the opening salvo and what will be bipartisan negotiations that will lead to a major fifth bill. Uh, and we see all of the support already from our governors, whether they be Democratic or Republican governors and other local government officials and so many others uh, supporting the HEROES Act. Um, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, has said that we need to take a pause, but the virus is not taking a pause. The economic consequences are not taking a pause. Now is a time that we must act, and that's what I intend to do. And that's why I'm flying to Washington tomorrow to vote on the HEROES Act. It'll include a lot of things that I specifically fought for. One of those things is funding for smaller cities. Those who have been following may know that the Hero or that the CARES Act, the earlier bill, it had state and local government funding, but not for cities smaller than 500,000 people. You probably know in our district, we have nothing but cities smaller than 500,000 people. Therefore, none of our cities got direct assistance under the CARES Act. Under the HEROES Act, however, almost $300 million would go directly to the cities of the 49th district. And I have to tell you that our mayors, whether they be Republican mayors or Democratic mayors have expressed that they are very pleased uh, with how this bill came together, directly responsive to their input, informed by uh, the feedback that we've received from our local government officials that they do need that help. And this bill will provide that help. Also $7.6 billion for community health centers. If you watched our town hall last week, we had the medical director of the Vista Community Clinic. They were left largely out of the CARES Act. They will be in the HEROES Act with plenty of resources to help community health centers. $25 billion to save the United States Postal Service. Uh, there's $4 billion in there for election security and a lot of steps uh, to take towards a more secure election in November and beyond. $100 billion for low-income renters hazard pay for our frontline workers, and a lot more. And this is a massive bill, by the way. This is a 1,815-page bill. This is the summary of the bill that I marked up last night. When the summary of a bill is 90 pages, you know you've got a long bill. But 1,815 pages, it's not perfect, not every word of it, but there are some key priorities. There was, in fact, a, uh, a piece of legislation for our military families to help prevent them from having to pay double rent because of the stop movement order. Uh, that bill that we introduced was included in the HEROES Act. I was thrilled about that. Uh, but if you're interested in all the details of this, I encourage you to visit our website. We have a full statement on the legislation, mikelevin.house.gov, where you can see a lot more detail about the bill 
We'll also be putting up a lot more on social media after this town hall. Uh, one thing that I always uh, try to do during these town halls is to share the number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, because I've been saddened to hear stories of increased domestic violence during COVID-19. I encourage anybody in need of help to call or text the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That number, again, is 1-800-799-SAFE. Uh, lastly, I'd like to encourage everybody to read the Coronavirus Federal Resource Guide that we published a couple of weeks ago on our website. Again, that's mikelevin.house.gov. And if you go backslash COVID-19, you will specifically see that resource guide, or you can get to it from the front page. It has a lot of information about basically all the federal programs that we've passed as part of the Families First Act, as part of the CARES Act, uh, so that you have all the information that you need uh, in order to uh, be able to apply, be able to receive uh, federal funding, whether you're a small business or an individual during this very difficult time. Uh, with that, I am very pleased and delighted to turn it over to our friend, Dr. Kenneth Roth. Dr. Roth, take it away. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, just kind of give a little background. You said uh, COVID is not over. Uh, no, we're still in the first inning, maybe the second inning, but uh, uh, I want to speak from the perspective of Sharp Healthcare. Uh, Sharp Healthcare uh, is the uh, leading provider of healthcare in San Diego County. We uh, provide service to more than 30% of uh, the discharges from hospitals in San Diego come from Sharp. And yet, with the COVID epidemic, we are presently treating 40% of all COVID patients. I uh, got an update on our numbers this morning and uh, we presently have 143 patients in our four facilities who are COVID positive. Uh, and we have presently 67 patients who are on ventilators, who are in full respiratory support uh, with COVID. Uh, Sharp Memorial Hospital, as you know, is in Kearney Mesa, our flagship hospital. Uh, but the crisis right now is in Chula Vista. It's in our South Bay. Uh, the difference between uh, sheltering in place in the United States, which we did in San Diego uh, very early, uh, that same action was not taken in Tijuana. Uh, San Diego and Tijuana are uh, combined in uh, one geographic area. We uh, Many people work and live uh, on both sides of the border, and the uh, virus does not respect the border. Uh, so... Uh, there's a lot of expatriates also in, uh, on the Mexican side of the border. And uh, many of those patients, uh, if you talk about a hot spot, uh, the South Bay of San Diego right now is a hot spot. Our ICU in Chula Vista is filled uh, with COVID patients all on the ventilator. Uh, same thing at Scripps Chula Vista, as well as El Centro Regional Medical Center in Imperial County and Yuma Regional Medical Center in Arizona. So all of the border hospitals are seeing the same surge, uh, very, very similar to what uh, you've seen on the news in New York City. So although in San Diego County, maybe some of you don't know of people who've had COVID or haven't had as much exposure, uh, right now we have a, a significant issue in the South Bay. One of the challenges for healthcare systems has been gearing up and getting ready for the epidemic. Uh, first uh, thought was to get manpower ready in case our frontline providers go down with the disease. And uh, I've seen such tremendous collabor collaboration amongst multiple groups of physicians to make sure that we had the manpower to deal with the surge. And, and I think we did an excellent job in terms of doing that. Uh, the shortfall was really with the PPE, uh, there was a rush uh, to get PPE, and uh, even though at times we were promised that we could get some PPE, uh, it didn't come through. There was a lot of price gouging. Uh, we are obligated to provide all of our bedside caregivers with the appropriate equipment, and uh, it's been a challenge. I can safely report that as of this morning, uh, we have three stages at which we look at PPE. Uh, less than 30 days is critical or red. Uh, 30 to 60 days is in the yellow, means we're safe, and greater than 60 days uh, we're comfortable. Uh, we have moved from the red to the yellow uh, for face masks, gloves, 
gowns and hand sanitizer. So as of today, uh, we, we do have uh, what we need, but we're starting to uh, start elective procedures. Uh, we're starting to reopen the rest of the hospital, which was closed in preparation for the epidemic. And since we're gonna be reopening and all those patients coming in are gonna be screened and we're gonna need a lot more PPE with those new patients coming in the hospital, our demand for it may go up and uh, we may find ourselves in short supply in the near future. Uh, that's from the hospital perspective. From the primary care perspective, I am a primary care physician. Uh, I can tell you that on March 17th, I've, I've been uh, working in a clinic practicing uh, primary care for 33 years. And in one day, uh, I started a telemedicine service. Um, hmm. I'm not the most uh, sophisticated with the computer, uh, but quite frankly, with some coaxing, we had many uh, senior citizens who we were able to talk on to coming on to the telemedicine service. And in a very, very short time, many of our patients adjusted from an office-based practice to a telemedicine service. And it's very hard, Mike, to predict as we go forward uh, the impact of this, uh, but I think of it similar to online shopping. Uh, when you get used to it, you make your mode of uh, shopping, uh, that's probably what you'll do in the future. We would like to transition to opening our office again, as would a lot of other people in town open their small businesses. Uh, but again, the psyche of the general public uh, we have to convince people that they're safe and uh, that uh, we'll do everything we can to protect them and make sure that they're in a safe environment. So the return back to work uh, will probably be a, a slow process, uh, but a lot of it will be uh, really driven by the psyche of those individuals. There'll be some who are hungry for it, and there are some who will be hesitant for it. Uh, well, from a distance, it's going to be interesting, Doc. You can't, you know, you can't tap me on the knee and get my knee to, to adjust. You can't look in my ears. You can't. You know, how do you do all that stuff? Doc? But I, I think that technology has enabled a lot of it. But, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, this is the new normal for, for so many, for educators and for doctors and for Congress members. You know, I, I think we're one of the other things we're doing tomorrow is voting or on Friday, rather, voting on. Um, remote voting by proxy and holding committee hearings by Zoom, uh, things like that, or by, uh, by Microsoft Teams and the rest. And uh, we're gonna be voting to do it for 45 days uh, as sort of a uh, short-term experiment, but I think it's important and necessary. But I'm very grateful that you're here. We have a ton of questions. I'm gonna jump right into them. We'll get to as many as we can. And uh, for those who have questions, uh, if you wanna comment on the feed on, on Facebook, or if you uh, want to email us, you can do that as well. Um, first question, how do we, and this is from David, how do we ensure that President Trump, his family, administration officials, and associates comply with the oversight provisions of the CARES Act? Well, as, as I said before, the CARES Act that we passed back in March had a lot of different oversight measures. It had an independent inspector general. It had a five-member oversight uh, commission um, that uh, the interesting part about that is the five members are selected by Speaker Pelosi, um, Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, Chuck Schumer, and then one member is selected by both uh, Speaker Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. So I don't think they've picked that fifth person yet. That's going to be very interesting. The act also has a prohibition on stock buybacks. It has a prohibition on um, executive pay above uh, reasonable levels. Um, and, you know, there are direct um, uh, pieces of it uh, that specifically preclude the president uh, from um, gaining with loans or investments uh, with the Treasury Department or the rest. And I think, you know, we, we read and I was very concerned with some of the reporting around the inspector general um, being uh, removed and, and somebody perhaps more um, or I should say less objective, more subjective about it uh, uh, being put in into that spot. Uh, we were all concerned by this. So one of the things that we did uh, recently is the speaker created the select committee on the coronavirus crisis. Uh, it's got, I believe, seven Democrats and five Republicans or, or six Republicans. And uh, it's chaired by Jim or by uh, James Clyburn, who's the senior member from South Carolina, really 
outstanding member of Congress, uh, House Majority Whip. And the first thing that that group has done is they've sent letters to certain recipients of the Paycheck Protection Program uh, who maybe shouldn't have received the funds, big corporations, publicly traded corporations, things of that sort. Uh, we know there were problems with the PPP program uh, and not so much that the president's family benefited, but that, uh, you know, we have a number of businesses like Shake Shack and the L.A. Lakers and others that, uh, you know, we never intended for businesses like that to receive uh, those funds. Nothing against the Lakers, nothing against Shake Shack or anything like that, but uh, clearly not the types of businesses we wanted to help. Uh, so I look for a lot more from that committee. I think that, um, you know, the fact that it's got um, Jim Clyburn at the helm, I think, and that it's modeled after the committee that Harry Truman chaired uh, during World War II. Uh, that committee cost $1 million for us to administer. And Harry Truman saved the United States government $15 billion in waste, fraud, and abuse uh, during World War II. So I'm confident that we're going to do everything to the fullest extent we can under the CARES Act. And if you look at the HEROES Act that we're voting on Friday, there's even more oversight provisions in it. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more uh, in the weeks and months ahead. But anything and everything we can do uh, to try to um, get the waste, fraud, and abuse, whether it's conflicts of interest with the president or other waste, fraud, and abuse, that's what we will try to do. Here's a question for you, doctor, from Steve in Oceanside. Steve says, I am a semi-retired 76-year-old Oceanside resident with active spinal stenosis and essential tremor medical issues, but I cannot get my medical issues addressed because my medical providers, VA Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente, have no in-person office hours and no elective surgeries during this pandemic. How can I get my necessary surgeries when I can't even visit my doctors to get MRIs and necessary surgery referrals because my doctors and surgeons are all sheltering in place at home. Telephone medical visits do very little to help with my medical needs. Tough question. Yeah, certainly we would love to be available to help him. Uh, <laughs> everybody is doing the best they can, and it's also a matter of protecting him. Uh, we want to make sure if he needs a procedure or has to come into a radiology suite or a hospital that he is protected and that he's not at risk for getting COVID. We're doing the best we can with telemedicine, with video visits. Um, but as you've said, it's, it's limited. Uh, but unfortunately, everybody has to be uh, tolerant and accepting because uh, these are very, very trying times. Thank you for that. Um, next question is from Janet. Janet asks very simply, what are you doing to get California and Americans back to work? Well, I think that is at the crux of the whole HEROES Act, uh, Janet. And I think at the end of the day, what we know uh, from our uh, public health experts, the data, the scientists, uh, folks like Dr. Roth, is that uh, we need to reopen safely. And in order to do so, we're going to need adequate testing and tracing, treatment, and eventually a vaccine. And when we think about testing, the best epidemiologists uh, that we have heard from, including on these town halls, they've said 152 tests per 100,000 people per day is what is needed to be safe. And where are we today? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so in the HEROES Act, there is uh, $75 billion specifically for testing and contact tracing. Now, we're also going to need a lot of contact tracing so that we can identify uh, who has uh, been in contact with those who have been sick and do all we can to isolate them, uh, to try to isolate the virus, to prevent the community spread that we've seen. Uh, and so between the testing and tracing, I'm confident the HEROES Act uh, has a lot in there. Now, we've already funded a lot of the testing apparatus through the CARES Act and through the interim package that we passed. Uh, we put 25 billion towards testing, including 11 billion towards the states. And there is a specific requirement in that interim legislation that the administration by May 24th must present to the Congress and the committees of jurisdiction a robust plan for both uh, the standard diagnostic testing as well as the antibody testing. 
and to date, including the testimony yesterday that I watched very closely from the CDC and from the FDA and from Dr. Fauci, to date, the administration has not, with the level of specificity required by that legislation, presented that plan. Now, testing, tracing, that's absolutely one thing we have to do. But what else do we need to do? Well, I'm a big believer that we've got to continue the assistance for our small businesses to whatever degree possible. The PPP was extremely important, but we've got to do more. And we've got to be responsive to those needs. The Main Street Lending Program and the other programs being administered by the Fed are going to be very important. Uh, we uh, are going to be evaluating other proposals uh, like putting millions of Americans back to work through infrastructure. I remain a big believer that if you have 33 million people and counting who are newly on the unemployment rolls, that you're not going to have all those jobs become available instantaneously once we can reopen safely. Some of those jobs are going to take time uh, if they come back at all. Therefore, we are going to need a plan to put millions of Americans back to work. And I think doing it with infrastructure, with the transportation and the broadband and the water and the electricity uh, of the grids of the future, the infrastructure of the future can put millions of Americans back to work through public works projects, just as we have done uh, throughout our history successfully. It will also yield significant positive economic return. Now, I'm as worried as anybody about the debt and the deficits. We're going to have a $4 trillion deficit this year, probably 20% deficit to GDP ratio. Our debt is approaching $30 trillion. Uh, we added, unfortunately, $3 trillion to the debt uh, in the first couple of years of the Trump administration before the pandemic. This despite the fact that the president said that he would try to eliminate the debt in eight years. He did exactly the opposite once in office. So we've got to have very serious discussions. But if you listen to the Fed chairman this morning, I think he said it correctly. We need to do all we can to mitigate a long-term, multi-year recession. We have to do it with aggressive action now. And that means we're going to have to create jobs. We're going to have to think boldly. And that's what we're doing with the HEROES Act and what I intend to do uh, with other legislation in the months ahead. Here's a question from Thomas. Thomas asks, my concern is the lack of a, a systematic approach to opening the states. Each state is doing their own plan without any marked decline in caseload. I believe in 30 days we will be dealing with a resurgence of COVID-19. Dr. Roth, you want to take the first crack at that from a public health and medical perspective? Yeah, uh, certainly I share the same concerns. I think we have to be very, very cautious about how we get back to business as usual. Uh, this is a virus and this virus uh, can be spread even in, by asymptomatic patients. And that's what makes uh, wearing the masks so important because you're keeping your own uh, environment on yourself and not spreading it to other people. So I, I agree. Uh, I think travel is uh, a, a bigger question. Uh, when people get on planes and go from one place to another, uh, the virus certainly gets uh, transported uh, when people travel more. So. I, I would caution everybody to be as cautious as they could be. So uh, as I get on a plane tomorrow, I will keep these words uh, in mind. We'll be um, talking for you. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, look, I think that we, in Governor Newsom, we've got somebody who is trying to collaborate as best as possible with the other governors of the Western states uh, in terms of a phase reopening. Uh, I think that uh, we've got some very thoughtful local leaders uh, on both sides of the aisle in San Diego County that I talk to frequently, uh, and in Orange County for that matter. Uh, I think that we've all got to come together and recognize the importance of having, having adequate testing to get back uh, to a uh, phase reopening, a safe reopening. Absent the testing and tracing, if you listen to Dr. Fauci yesterday, uh, he laid it out very clearly, uh, and it's something that we all ought to be cognizant of. And Dr. Fauci is a straight shooter. He's going to tell the American people the truth. That's what he's been doing for decades. And what he did yesterday morning at that hearing is he said loud and clear, we need the testing, the tracing, the uh, treatments, the vaccines, and we've got to follow the science. And so I would implore all states to do that. I think we're doing that in California. And I think that's why we've seen, compared to many states, a 
more favorable outcome and a lot of uh, infection and a lot of death that has been prevented by virtue of what we did. Next from Betsy, how can states get testing and tracing done without Trump intervening to stop it? He even said that testing will make us look bad. I don't know if I heard him say that. He may have thought that. <laughs> well, my opinion is that the Trump administration certainly could be doing more with regard to testing. Uh, they have to, by law, by May 24th, present a robust strategy for testing. Um, Governor Cuomo certainly has uh, discussed very articulately the need for the federal government to step up, particularly with the supply chain for things like swabs and reagents. Um, but I certainly believe that we can work collaboratively, federal, state, and local, uh, to make this happen. I, I don't see anybody uh, in the administration standing in the way of California or San Diego or Orange County is trying to get adequate testing. So I would encourage us all to work collaboratively to whatever extent we possibly can. You know, I uh, led a letter uh, to Vice President Pence and Secretary Azar recently on the national testing strategy to understand what it was they were doing. I also led a letter to Orange County a couple of days ago trying to understand what it was that they were doing and how we could be helpful, uh, how we could try to bring whatever federal resources necessary to help them. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, we're going to need a broad national mobilization around testing and tracing. And it's the only way, ultimately, that we can deal with the public health aspects of this and therefore the only way we can truly deal long term with the economic uh, aspects of this as well. Anything to add to that, doctor? Yeah, and just in that it's a, an evolving art. Uh, we really don't have reliable uh uh, certified antibody testing that, that, you know, right now with the 20% false negative rate on antibody testing, uh, as a provider, it's very hard for me to have much confidence that I'm telling my patients that they have uh, good immunity to the, to the virus. So. Thank you, doctor. Laura asks a recent or says a recent New York times opinion piece said that increasing funding for SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and making food stamps widely available would be a better system for getting food to people who are without it right now. What are your views about moving money and efforts out of prioritizing a food bank system and into SNAP? Well, Laura, thank you. That's a great question. I don't think it should be an either or uh, between SNAP and food banks. I, I think we uh, are well served by both programs. And we've got to do all we can to get food to those who need it in our communities. Um, recently, I was at the North County Food Bank as an example. They're doing an amazing job um, serving about 600,000 families uh, a month. Uh, there are all sorts of great uh, food bank uh, programs going on throughout San Diego and Orange Counties. And, you know, I, I think that we need more for SNAP as well. That's why the HEROES Act uh, increases SNAP funding by 15 percent. I think that's the right approach. It's something we wanted to do as part of the family's first bill. We weren't able to get it, or as part of the uh, CARES Act, we, we did get additional money for SNAP as part of the family's first bill. We wanted it for CARES. We didn't get it in CARES. We want it again as part of HEROES, and we're going to fight very hard uh, for that. Uh, Heloisa in Carlsbad asks, I understand San Diego has been taking care of San Diego homeless, providing motels and housing to those that were already in shelters. Also, San Francisco has been putting them up in motels, even those that are not clean and sober. Any possibility of doing the same here in Encinitas, Carlsbad, or Oceanside? Well, thank you for the question. I know that in addition to what San Diego County has done, that the cities uh, are all trying to take a number of steps to address their local homeless population, and that means additional options for shelter. Um, you know, I know that Oceanside has a homeless uh, outreach team uh, they're doing outstanding work. They have a social worker and they have uh, nurses and they, they do everything they can uh, there. Uh, that being said, I think we need to do a lot more. I think um, we've got to prioritize sheltering the homeless population uh, to, to try to mitigate the worst impact that COVID-19 could have. Uh, and as we've said, it's impossible to shelter in place if you don't have shelter. So we've got to do all we can. There is quite a bit more money, federal money, in the HEROES Act for homeless and for those at risk of becoming homeless. And in particular, there's money for homeless veterans. Uh, and there's flexibility to help 
uh, the VA be able to provide direct services to homeless veterans, uh, regardless of whether they normally will qualify for other VA services. So those are provisions that we advocated for and we're very happy are part of that bill. I, I've been very concerned. We've made such great progress on veterans employment, veterans homelessness, and because of this pandemic, that's gonna take a dramatic step back. And I'm very, very saddened by that. Obviously, I chair the subcommittee that has jurisdiction over those issues. And we're encouraged that a lot of what we advocated for made it into the HEROES Act uh, with regard to veterans. Rhonda in Encinitas asks, what are the remedies, medicines, and best practices for people to use to treat the virus successfully at home? Dr. Roth. Well, I wish there was a treatment for coronavirus. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, data or literature that suggests that anything successfully treats coronavirus. But a virus uh, is an opportunist, and it looks for people who are vulnerable. I think you need to focus on eating healthy, uh, not over imbibing, uh, and getting exercise, and uh, mitigating your stress level. Uh, when people get run down, when their immune system is run down, they're more likely to get a virus. Uh, if you're sheltering in place, do everything you can to stay as healthy as you can, which requires good exercise, healthy diet, good sleep patterns, and minimal stress. That sound, those sounds like pretty good things to do anyway. <laughs> there you go. Very good. Warren in Ladera Ranch says, I'm a small business owner and received a PPP loan and have started to hire back employees we furloughed in mid-March. As we try to reopen, we have asked employees to return and several have said they would not come back for a few months because they are receiving more from unemployment benefits due to the extra $600 they are getting weekly. In fact, several have asked to be put on reduced hours so they can keep their job and receive UI benefits. Well, I think this is the challenge when we figured out what to do uh, in the, the wake of this pandemic. Uh, I think there is a balance between trying to uh, help our businesses reopen, but recognize the uh, dramatic toll this has taken on so many workers. Uh, I, I think that there are some who may receive uh, more with unemployment, uh, but uh, in general, um, I have heard uh, that that is not the case. Uh, of course, there are, there are always instances where uh, it's the exception rather than the rule, and that sounds like that's the case for your business. Um, what I would say is that these benefits are temporary, uh, and we're not going to be able to keep them ongoing forever. I think people are going to need to go uh, back to work at some point. I think most people want to go back to work, uh, and I would hope the businesses that are reopening uh, won't have any trouble finding people. My goodness, we've got 33 million that have filed for unemployment insurance in the last seven weeks. I would hope that most businesses won't have that much trouble finding individuals who are ready, willing, and able to go back to work given this current economic climate. Uh, but uh, thank you, and uh, obviously as we look to craft future programs, we'll keep those comments in mind. Lisa asks, what can you do to help provide behavioral health services for the healthcare workers that are on the front lines? Now and more in the future, they will need our support and resources to help balance their emotional and mental health. Do you feel the federal government can provide any leadership or support on this? Um, well, we've got to do a lot more uh, with regard to behavioral health and mental health services and, and the HEROES Act uh, and the CARES Act both have provisions that would do that and, and help provide behavioral health funding, mental health funding. Uh, we also know that uh, for the veterans community, again, my briefings with the Veterans Health Administration, mental health related telehealth meetings are um, much higher than they uh, historically have been, going from around 40,000 per month, normally up to over 150,000 in March, and they think 300,000 in April, just for mental health related telehealth appointments at the VA. Uh, so I have uh, written to congressional leadership uh, about the next COVID-19 package. I think we're uh, going to see, uh, you know, in addition to the, the HEROES Act, I think we'll have an opportunity to continue to weigh in on this, and so we're going to need to do more uh, with regard to mental health, uh, specifically for uh, for those on the front lines. Uh, anything to add to that, Doctor? Nope, I agree 100%. Uh, All right. Frontline people, and it's uh, very, very stressful. Tim asks, are we getting another stimulus check since nobody can go back to work yet? 
Well, the you might know the CARES Act had a $1,200 uh, direct cash payment to those making $75,000 a year or less, with a smaller payment to those making between $75,000 and $100,000 a year, $500 per dependent. The HEROES Act, as it's currently written, has another $1,200 direct cash payment. Uh, and so you would receive another $1,200 payment uh, up to $6,000 per family. Every member of your family gets $1,200 under the HEROES Act uh, provision. So if we can negotiate with the Senate and we can get that into law, then the answer is yes. Um, you know, and obviously my belief all along has been that we need to continue some sort of payment until things get back to a positive direction with regard to our economy. We either tie it to the unemployment rate, we tie it, you know, perhaps the gross domestic product, um, and we continue those payments uh, with some sort of uh, stabilization, uh, whether it's unemployment rate or GDP. That's my, my opinion. Michael asks, what is your take on a potential coronavirus vaccine? If created, do you condone making it mandatory? Doctor, you wanna start with that? Well, certainly uh, everybody in the world is trying to come up with a corona vaccine. Uh, the trick is finding a vaccine that's safe and a vaccine that's effective. Uh, if a safe and effective vaccine uh, can be uh, invented, uh, think of distributing to everyone in the world. Uh, this would be significantly mass produced. Absolutely, if we can uh, vaccinate patients so that we develop antibodies, uh, the corona vaccine could be a thing of the past. Uh, I think it's very, very uh, important step for ending this epidemic. Well, thank you. And I certainly agree with what you said, uh, doctor. And I'm very hopeful that, you know, we're trying a new approach to this where we're, I, know, I know we're um, developing many different vaccines all at once with the understanding that hopefully one of them will, will work. And we're trying to do all this in record time. And uh, it's obviously our great hope. And we've, sent, we've spent billions of dollars in the last four bills uh, for development of a vaccine. And uh, the fifth bill, the HEROES Act, includes money for the CDC and the NIH and others to continue in that work. Uh, and I'm very grateful to those working on that in uh, our district and uh, throughout our region, some of the leading minds in the world on vaccines and, and for that matter, on the therapeutics as well. Kim asks, I would like to know what the government is doing about the Employment Development Department and the fact that many people have yet to receive payments. It's been a month since I applied and then certified for four weeks, yet I have not seen a single payment. What is being done to help with this? Well, Kim, I am very sorry to hear about this because all the, and we heard a lot about initial delays at EDD. Basically, the EDD is a state agency and the California Secretary of Labor spoke with us about some of these delays. Uh, we changed certain requirements uh, for unemployment insurance. We created, as part of the CARES Act, we created the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance uh, Funds, uh, PUA funds uh, or program. And we also expanded by $600 a week the amount eligible. So we changed the, uh, or, or the amount received. So we changed eligibility and we changed the amount. Um, the EDD, like many state uh, agencies uh, throughout the country uh, that look to implement the CARES Act provisions around unemployment insurance, found that they had very antiquated uh, technology and that from a logistics perspective, basically what they needed to do, particularly with the PUA, with the expanded um, uh, gig economy workers, independent contractors who'd never before been eligible for unemployment, uh, benefits, but now are, they needed to rework their system from the ground up. So that's what they did. Uh, what I would ask is that if you could directly get in touch with our office in Oceanside, uh, you can also uh, contact us in Washington or in uh, our Orange County office in Dana Point. We'd be delighted to assist to try to help. Uh, and if we can't directly help, we can refer you to um, folks at the state level uh, whether it's at the assembly or senate level who can directly interface with the state employment development department to help you get those unemployment uh, benefits that you now are eligible for uh, since the CARES Act passed. Uh, but I'm very sorry to hear about this. 
Matt in Oceanside asks, do you think it is right for certain California counties to attempt to overrule the governor? Well, California is a big state. I think the governor has referred to it as a nation state. You've got 58 counties. You've got some that are very urban. You've got some that are very rural. I think everyone is trying to do their best based on the facts on the ground. Um, I think the, the virus doesn't care if you're in a rural urban, suburban, exurban, the virus is the virus. And we've got to be smart and we've got to safely reopen. And that means that the governor has put in place some phases uh, with testing criteria, rate of infection, rate of death, and so forth. Uh, my great hope is that uh, we can, at least at the local level, uh, continue to work collaboratively. Uh, I think in uh, San Diego and Orange counties, they both have around 3.2, 3.3 million people. And Based on the state guidelines, uh, they both should aspire to around 5,200 tests per day. Uh, and right now, San Diego County is doing about 2,500 a day, give or take. Orange County is doing anywhere from you know, yesterday was like 400 tests. And sometimes there have been 2,000 tests, things like that. I think the key here is that we've got to get on the same page with regard to who is tested. Uh, and we've got to move from just those who are symptomatic to those who are asymptomatic, because we know that the virus is asymptomatically transmitted. There are those at high risk at places like nursing homes, at places like prisons, at places like food processing plants. We've got to begin uh, testing asymptomatic individuals in high at-risk locations, as well as others who are highly at risk. That's what they have done in every other country where they have actually figured out a way to sufficiently flatten the curve to safely reopen. So that's what I hope all of our counties can do is just follow the science, follow the data and do what we know from a public health perspective, from an epidemiological perspective, is uh, the, the right path forward. Uh, and I hope we get there. Dr. Roth, any thoughts on this? Absolutely. You know, very difficult when during the early phases of COVID, we had such limited abilities to test. Uh, we really saved the testing for the most critically ill patients. Now that we have more tests available, bringing that out to high-risk individuals and the general population is certainly the next step. Uh, I, I agree, 100%. Well, hopefully we will get there. Next question is from Richard. When you cross the border, and you talked about the border before, doctor, when you cross the border from Tijuana to San Diego, should border officers be wearing a face mask? I will ask you first, doctor. Well, so and any other any other border issues that you care to discuss? <laughs> I don't want to touch the border issues. Uh, <laughs> anybody who comes within six feet of another individual should be wearing a mask. And the reason for wearing the mask is to protect uh, other people from any uh, viruses that might be living on your person. So out of respect to those people around you, uh, anybody in a high volume area where there'll be a lot of traffic, uh, should certainly be wearing uh, a mask. Fair enough. And I, I think that the CDC has issued some pretty clear recommendations on PPE for law enforcement, and that would certainly include wearing masks. Um, next question from Gina in Vista. Gina asks, what are essential businesses or which businesses are allowed to stay open or continue to work? Well, there are a bunch of different types of essential businesses. There was actually a laundry list of them that came out when the stay-at-home order was first put out. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about anybody that protects public health, public safety, or, or provides essential needs or essential services, uh, everything from gas stations to grocery stores to food banks. Uh, and over time, uh, the governor has updated this guidance. So I would recommend uh, that uh, you follow um, the state of California, state of California, state of California, California, uh, California social media, media or, or, uh, or uh, in, you know, in any other manner. Any other manner that you and uh, also that you look at that updated guidance. Uh, we've got to reduce risk. We've got to do all we can uh, to try to uh, um, get the economy open, but do so in a way that's uh, mitigating the potential for risk. You may have seen just this week uh, things like bookstores, jewelry stores, toy stores, pretty much anything where you could get a Mother's Day present uh, was uh, at least allowed to do curbside service. I know they're now talking about uh, broadening that where you can go to a mall or an outlet 
the center and you can get a uh, curbside pickup. Um, but I would uh, really recommend you go to the governor's website. It's ca.gov and specifically covid19.ca.gov. Laura and Encinitas asks, when can we expect our libraries to be open? I see hundreds of people inside stores such as Target, Home Depot, and assorted grocery stores. Well, it's frustrating. Ultimately, it is up to state and local officials to determine when we open things like libraries. And many of the libraries are county libraries, some are city libraries, so I'd recommend you get in touch with your mayor or with your county supervisors about that, depending on the facility. Uh, but I think that it's going to be a phased reopening, and I think, um, you know, obviously we're going to we're going to uh, reopen things that uh, we can do so safely um, as quickly as we can. Kid asks, "What is your plan for paying down this debt once this crisis is over?" Well, we talked about that a little bit before. Thirty trillion dollars, and the good news is that to the extent that we are borrowing, we are borrowing in a very low interest rate environment. As the Fed chairman said, it's time now, if there ever were a time, to go big. That doesn't mean that the debt is a good thing. It means that we're going to have to have very serious discussions in future years about spending, about revenue, and we've got to do all we can to get back on track. Um, I, I unfortunately wish that the years leading up to the pandemic, specifically 2017, 2018, 2019, we were better able uh, to manage our debt and deficits. We wound up uh, putting an additional uh, three trillion dollars worth of debt uh, on top of what we already had. So clearly not good. And moving forward, we need it. I've said this before. We need a new Simpson Bowl style commission that will thoroughly review and evaluate all the potential options there and come to some conclusions on the basis of how we can get on a solid fiscal footing long term. I continue to believe, however, that things like infrastructure that provide a significant long term economic benefit are wise investments. And I think there are differences between costs, such as uh, massive tax cuts for large corporations and things like uh, the 2017 tax bill, major provisions of which I staunchly opposed. Uh, versus um, what we're seeing with things like infrastructure, where we know that it'll create the good jobs of the future at a time where we desperately need to create those jobs. So I think we have to have that serious discussion about differences between costs and investments. And, you know, not every political donor will appreciate, particularly the, the big corporations that are lining the pockets of some people, uh, not me, but some people, uh, who uh, rely on those big corporate donations. You know, it's uh, unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation, something we're, we're going to have to try to overcome, which is why finally we need campaign finance reform, which is uh, ultimately at the root of much of the, the reason that government overspends. Okay, here is Gary, who is a commenter from the last town hall. Uh, he says, and this is for you, doctor, if you get the virus and survive, are you then immune? You want to talk about immunity? Sure. Uh, anytime you've been exposed to a virus, uh, your body uh, tries to fight off that bot, bot, uh, virus and uh, makes antibodies. Uh, the antibodies does give you some degree of protection in the future, uh, but the question is immune. Immune meaning that you will not get the disease again. Uh, we do not have a way of measuring antibody titers, and that's the amount of antibody response that an individual gets. Uh, at some point in time, we'll know what titer is necessary to give somebody immunity, uh, but as of right now, we do not have uh, testing to uh, confirm that. Uh, so uh, actually, the World Health Organization last week said that patients who are IgG COVID positive meaning that they had an immunoglobulin G response to COVID should not necessarily consider themselves immune. Thank you. How about this notion of herd immunity? Is, when are we going to know whether this is uh, actually going to happen? Well, that goes back to your test and tracing uh, methodology. Uh, if we can ensure that enough people are positive, have had exposure, then the virus really doesn't have an opportunity to run rampant through our population anymore. Uh, that will come with vaccines and just enough people having been exposed to the virus. Uh, so 
tincture of time. Okay. Sounds good. Well, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everybody for the outstanding questions. And again, if you have uh, further questions, we'll try our best to get to them uh, in the uh, town halls in the weeks ahead. Uh, I want to, again, uh, recommend that uh, if you're interested in other provisions of our major legislation that we're doing Friday, the HEROES Act, please visit our website, mikelevin.house.gov. Uh, it's an amazingly comprehensive bill, but I think uh, it will do a lot to address both the public health issues that we face as well as the economic crisis that we face. Uh, and uh, I also am very grateful to Dr. Roth for talking about some of these public health issues in a very straightforward uh, manner and uh, was wondering if you had any closing remarks or thoughts as we look at where we are today with COVID-19 and perhaps where we need to get in the months ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, again, it's a honor and a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I've just seen such a tremendous coming together from our community. Uh, the amount of support for the bedside caregivers, uh, philanthropy, philanthropic donations in terms of trying to help us to fight this virus, and uh, breaking down of walls and barriers like we've never seen before. Uh, this pandemic affects everybody uh, in some way, shape, or form, and it's really great to focus on the positive, uh, how well we've come together as a community to face this challenge. And I feel very, very grateful uh, to, to be a healthcare provider during these times. And thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts and, uh, with, with your uh, constituency. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it, Doctor, and we uh, very much uh, thank you and thank all of our frontline medical workers for everything that they do day in and day out, uh, in many cases putting their own health and safety ahead of, uh, or putting, putting the health and safety of others, I should say, ahead of their own health and safety. Uh, you really do recognize during a time like this uh, just the meaningful contributions. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do with this HEROES bill uh, is really recognize the, the uh, essential workers, the uh, folks who are uh, really making the difference in our communities in our country. Uh, and this bill does that, uh, the one that we're voting on on Friday, uh, both by uh, providing funding for our, our local and state governments, or everybody from our uh, frontline uh, healthcare folks, but also our law enforcement, our firefighters, our teachers, uh, everybody that really makes our uh, society just go day in and day out uh, that we often take for granted. Uh, it provides a HEROES fund for them. Uh, so that they receive the hazard pay that uh, they deserve uh, during this time. Uh, it also very, very importantly includes uh, money for testing and tracing uh, so that we can continue to move beyond uh, th this issue where we just don't um, test enough people or we are very restrictive about um, who we test. You know, I think that's another very big misconception out there is that uh, for a number of weeks, we've only been limited in certain cases to testing uh, those with every symptom. You know, you have to have every, every symptom in order to get a test. And it's ultimately the difference between, you know, hearing that anybody who wants a test can get a test and then hearing that anybody who needs a test can get a test and then recognizing that need is a bit of a uh, unusual and uh, open to interpretation uh, term in the sense that we need more asymptomatic people who are in higher risk environments to get tested, uh, like those who are potentially going back to school in the fall, um, like those who are working at nursing homes and who are certainly living in, in nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, uh, like those uh, in our prisons uh, and uh, those who work in our prisons or um, you know, our, our other detention facilities where we've seen just stunning rates uh, of uh, infection. Uh, and those in our food processing facilities, uh, where we know because people are working in very close proximity to one another that there's a higher risk of infection. Um, all of those people are going to need to be tested, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. And so that means we're going to need the tests to be able to get that done. And the best public health experts in the United States have said we need about 152 tests per day per 100,000 people. And we're simply not there. And we've got to do everything we can to leverage whatever federal resources we can. And again, Trump administration has till May 24th to present that plan. So important 
uh, that we get there. And uh, really appreciate uh, everyone's sacrifice during this time. Again, I'm as frustrated with these stay-at-home orders as anybody. I think we all want to get back to work. We want to do so safely. Uh, that means we need the testing in place. That means we need the tracing in place. Uh, and it's critical that we follow the guidelines every day uh, from the CDC, from our state, from our county, from our cities, uh, social distancing, staying home unless you cannot, uh, taking the ba basic health precautions that we all know now that I hope will become commonplace, like frequent hand washing. Um, and, you know, to the extent that we can all do that, uh, it would certainly help as we try to get through this together. So I'm grateful to you, doctor, for your leadership. Thankful to my incredible staff, my, my great chief, uh, Kara in DC and Eric, our communications director, Jonathan uh, and Faith and Robbie, our whole legislative team and everybody in our district office, Francine and Kyle and Shannon, Andy uh, and everybody in our uh, district offices, Terry working very hard in Orange County. Thank you all so, so much for all that you do. And thanks for watching, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, on our website. We're grateful that you're here. We hope you join us again next week. Thank you all so much.